So um, it is just another weekday afternoon. The kids are home from school. One is at the table trying to remember how to do long division. The other claimed that he didn't have any homework, and so he's in the living room playing video games. The smell of meatloaf fills the house, and all is at peace. But at a quarter past five, the sound of the garage door opening sparks a familiar fear in the family, and immediately the hearts of each person starts to beat a little harder. They are all wondering, who is coming through that door tonight? Will it be sober dad or will it be drunk dad? Nobody knows for sure. The fact that he's home a little earlier than normal offers some hope that he didn't have time to guzzle down too many beers between work and home, but still, drunk dad has not made an appearance for a few days, and so he is due for a visit. They hold their breath as the door forcefully swings open, hitting the door stop with such force that the doorknob somehow makes contact with the wall. They zero in on his reddened face, which always gives him away. It's drunk dad. They were hoping for Mr. Hyde, but instead, it's Dr. Jekyll. Is anyone going to help me? He slurs loudly as his bloodshot eyes glare at his wife. She darts over to retrieve the duffel bag from his shoulder and catches a well-known whiff of the spearmint gum that always fails to disguise the smell of Coors Light. Then he stammers into the kitchen, sweat beads on his forehead, and his white dress shirt clings to his chest. Drunk dad is drunker than normal, and that means he will be angrier than normal too. He staggers onto his favorite recliner, muttering incomprehensible nonsense under his breath. Uh, Dad, did you want to watch TV? His son asks while quickly turning his video game off. Of course I want to watch TV, drunk dad shouts at spit flies from his mouth. What a stupid question. Don't I always watch TV when I get home from work? Then he struggles to work the remote control as the rest of the family begins making eye contact with one another. They have been here so many times before that they can almost read each other's thoughts. Mom's thoughts are saying, keep your distance and keep quiet. Don't don't make any noise to provoke him. She offers a reassuring smile that does very little to dampen the fear. Each of them wonders what is about to happen. What will this night bring? Life has taught them that the best case scenario is that they'll somehow be able to appease him all the way through dinner, then get him back on the couch where he could very well pass out. That's happened before. It could happen tonight, but it is unlikely. Instead, What's likely to happen is is someone will say something or give a look that will set him off. Then he will spew hateful words laced with the worst cuss words in the English language. He will likely throw something before it's all over. Maybe the remote, his plate, a glass. Of course, the worst happens usually after mom sends the kids to bed early and they are glad to go. But then they are tortured by the sounds of whispered pleas for mercy, slaps, and muffled sobs. You know, I don't have to convince anyone in this room that drunkenness is a terrible state for a person to be in. I I don't have to tell many of you because many of you have lived through evenings just like the one I just described. And some of you have lived through much worse abuse at the hand of a drunkard. Just based on statistical probability, there is someone here who was physically abused as a child by their drunken mom or their drunken dad. Uh, There may very well be someone here today who was sexually abused by their drunken parent. And again, just based on the statistical likelihood, there is most certainly several people here today who have been emotionally or psychologically abused by a drunken parent or a spouse. Because drunkenness 
has become extremely common in our culture, and it is a major force of sin and of destruction. Drunkenness leads to crime. We all know that. It is estimated that about 40% of inmates who are imprisoned for violent crimes were under the influence of alcohol when they committed that crime. And not only does drunkenness lead to crime, it also leads to sexual promiscuity. And we know that too. Drunkenness lowers our inhibitions and cripples our judgment, which opens us up to this terrible kind of decision-making. That's why drunkenness often leads to multiple sex partners. And of course, it won't surprise any of us to hear that drunkenness also leads to all sorts of risky sexual behaviors that has resulted in a huge increase of sexually transmitted diseases. And again, it won't surprise any of you to hear that drunkenness destroys relationships because it leads to adultery, violence, divorce, and death. My own uncle died of drunkenness. Now, to my knowledge, he was not a violent or an angry alcoholic, but he was highly addicted to alcohol. And even when he was in the hospital dying of cirrhosis of the liver, do you know what he wanted more than anything? A drink. And so alcohol abuse can end a relationship in a variety of ways, and one way is through early death. One study concluded that people hospitalized with alcohol use disorder have an average expectancy of about 50 years old for men, 54 for women. Children are deeply affected by drunkenness in ways that we don't really even fully understand. Studies prove that children raised around drunkenness will be more anxious, more depressed, and have more behavioral problems. Now lastly, and this might be one of the worst effects of all of drunkenness, drunkenness leads to more drunkenness. In other words, it is handed down like a family heirloom because guess what teenagers often use to escape the pain of drunkenness? Well, it doesn't make much sense to me, but very often they turn to alcohol. It is very common that the very tool that Satan is using to destroy their father or their mother, they too will turn to. In fact, it is estimated that the Children of alcoholics are four times more likely to become a drunkard than other people because for good or bad, we model what we see. And that's why I understand drunkenness as a generational curse. And more than once, I have heard from young people who make these vows of abstinence declaring, I will never be anything like my dad, or I will never be anything like my mother. I'm not even going to touch alcohol. I hate it because of what it did to our family. But then what happens? So many times, those raised by drunkards become drunkards or drug addicts. Somehow they quickly become what they had said they so strongly hated. How does that happen? How does drunkenness overtakes so many people, even the ones who never vowed never to partake in alcohol. Well, today we're going to continue in our sermon series to the book of Romans, and we come to the end of Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, and it says this, and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer Then when we first believed, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now, all I read there was five sentences, but there is a lot there. So we're going to kind of unpack this one sentence at a time. First, verse 11 tells us to wake up from our sleep because our salvation is nearer 
than when we first believed. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means a few things. First, I think it means that the rapture and the end of time is closer now than it's ever been. And that makes sense. And at the same time, the Apostle Paul seems to be telling us that our time individually is running out. The clock is ticking. We will not live in these mortal bodies forever. And so that means that we should be fighting against this slumber of apathy because it's really so easy to be kind of a lazy, apathetic Christian. Don't you agree? You know, I don't want to read my Bible this morning. I don't want to pray. I'm too tired for that. I don't want to lead my family spiritually. I don't want to go to life groups. You know, my kid doesn't want to go anyway. Well, you know, my five-year-old doesn't want to brush his teeth, but if I don't make him, decay will set in. And so if you are a Christ follower who is kind of just going through the, mo- the motions in an apathetic, sleepy slumber, the Apostle Paul is telling you to wake up. Wake up because you don't really know how much time you've got left. So a person can be, can, be sla- can be saved for sure, but they can also be going through the motions, apathetic, you know, just kind of sleeping on the job as a Christian. You know, years ago, my brother Robert got a job working at, uh, with my dad at a meat packing plant. And for one summer, Robert would get up with my dad at four o'clock in the morning and drive over to Louisville where they would give him a variety of jobs to do. Well, one day they gave him the task of putting together these big cardboard boxes. Well, being the smart guy that Robert is, he used these boxes to construct a fortress around himself. And once he was completely hidden, he took a nap. Of course, he got caught, but isn't that kind of what we do? You know, we we construct these walls, these these lives of comfort and entertainment. We busy ourselves with all these things that really are not important things at all, while the things of God are often, you know, neglected. We need to wake up. We need to be alert. Okay, so the next few uh, verses express what I understand to be one of the themes of the Bible. Starting in verse 12, it says... The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now, darkness is one of those words that can be difficult to to describe, but that is okay because I think we all have a pretty good idea of what it is. Last Easter, I read that author J.R. Tolkien poetically described darkness this way. He said, it cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills laughter. Physically speaking, darkness is not really the opposite of light. Rather, it is the absence of light. And biblically speaking, darkness is used as a metaphor throughout the Bible for a few things, including sin and evil. And so it is darkness when drunkenness hurts innocent people. It is darkness when addiction inflicts terror on a family or results in sexual perversion. That is darkness. In the book of John chapter 3, verse 19, we learn that many people love the darkness because their deeds are evil, it says. And so that's one form of darkness. But another way the Bible uses the word darkness is to describe despair, and depression, darkness is dread. It's that feeling that you just can't make it through one more day. It is a deep discouragement. And then lastly, the Bible uses the word darkness to describe someone who has lost his way. John 12 verse 35 tells us that the one who walks in darkness does not know where they are going. And this describes a lot of people today who kind of stumble around in confusion and in in denial. They have traded God's hard truth for Satan's easy lies. And so they choose addiction over a sound, stable mind, and they end up profoundly confused and lost in darkness. 
Okay, so then verse 13 goes on to instruct us to walk properly as in the day. So what does that mean? Well, has your mom ever told you that nothing good happens after 10 p.m.? Because there is a lot of truth to that. You know, I've thought about in my own life, when is it that I committed my darkest, worst sins? Well, it was under the cover of darkness at night. And every police officer will tell you that when the sun goes down, crime goes up. Partiers do not go to day clubs. They go to nightclubs. And in the dark, dark deeds happen. And so Paul is telling us to be children of the day. Walk in the light. And next, I want you to notice that he gives us three pairs of words, which very specifically tell us how not to behave if we want to walk in the day or in the light. So these three sets of words represent darkness and evil. And again, Paul is saying to, that to walk properly as in the day and not in these ways. The first is revelry and drunkenness. Second is lewdness and lust. And the third is strife and envy. He is saying, Christian, get rid of these things. Take these things off. Cast them away, he says. Okay, so we're going to go through each one of these pairs of words over the next couple of weeks. The first is revelry and drunkenness. Now, why are these words paired with each other? Well, it's because one leads to the other. A revel is a wild party, and revelry means participation in a noisy, drunken party. Reveling can also mean self-indulgence. Reveling also is associated with drunken orgies and disorderly conduct. And reveling will not appeal to a Christian who is walking in the day. In fact, as I described reveling, many of you were repulsed. It literally sickens you to think about people behaving this way. But the truth is, drunkenness is so dangerous because when you're drunk, you are compromised. In fact, how many of us have heard stories of people who were so drunk that they don't even remember the night before? They don't know what they did. They don't know what they said. They don't know where they went. And when they find out, they themselves are repulsed by their own behavior. Drunkenness lowers our inhibitions. It blinds our judgment. Now, I think it would also be very safe to say that any substance that has a similar effect as alcohol should be classified into this same category. For instance, Marijuana will alter you, and so, and so will all sorts of other drugs. But the point is, whether you are getting drunk or getting high, you are not sober-minded, which is what God calls us to be. Now, I bring up marijuana specifically because I know of self-proclaiming Christians who say that weed is just some harmless substance that helps them to relax. You know, there was a teenager who I, who I knew who defended marijuana like I was attacking her best friend. Even when I pointed out the fact that weed is still illegal in Indiana, that did not deter her. I've got my own ideas about that, she said. Well, anytime someone uses the phrase, I've got my own ideas about that, when it comes to drugs and alcohol, you can be sure that they are in a rebellious posture. Marijuana is not harmless. Marijuana is classified as a mind-altering psychoactive drug, and it not only robs its users of sobriety, it also takes away their ambition. You know, even when I was in high school, the pot users were always very easy to spot. They were the ones in the back of the rooms with their head on their desks. They were relaxed to to the point that they were completely checked out. They had no ambition. An overachieving pot user is impossible to find. And just like alcohol, pot will lower your, your inhibitions. 
And you will find yourself many times open to things that you wouldn't have considered, considered before. That's one of the reasons I believe that marijuana is indeed a gateway drug. Not for everybody, but, but for many people. They start with weed, and over time, fentanyl doesn't sound so bad. Remember that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self Control And when we consume mind-altering substances, we are surrendering control. Now, from the book of Genesis all the way to the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, there is story after story about how drunkenness has led to even more offensive sins. It leads to more sin. Way back in Genesis 9, Noah gets drunk and then falls asleep uncovered. In other words, he passed out naked. Then Lot... In Genesis uh, chapter 19, got so drunk that he had an incestuous, incestuous, why am I saying that word wrong? Incestuous encounter with his own daughter. Maybe because it's such a gross thing, I just can't bring myself to say it. It's yuck. Then King David hoped to cover up his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba by getting her husband Uriah Drunk And on and on throughout the Bible, we have this historical record that drunkenness leads to perversion and destruction. And of course, that is still the case today. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Galatians 5.21 says, Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6.10 says something similar. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Okay, so now that I've said all that, I want to say something else very clearly. The Bible does not condemn alcohol. I've made some of you mad by saying that, but it just doesn't. If you really study it, you will see that Jesus himself drank wine, and he turned water into wine. Very few biblical scholars will argue the fact that that had some alcoholic content in it. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, Paul acknowledges the medicinal value of wine. And so... I try very hard never to condemn what God does not. Christians do have the freedom to drink. There's really no denying that. And so if you are an adult over 21 and you have a glass of wine with your dinner or you have a beer after you mow the grass, I am not going to look down on you and I'm not going to judge you because I do not have the biblical basis to do that. But something that I think every Christian should think about is this. How might my drinking affect the people around me? You know, John Maxwell says we're all leaders because we all have a sphere of influence. And so I think it's a good thing to stop and ponder, how is my drinking affecting people within my sphere? And I say this because alcoholism runs in my family. And it runs in Megan's family. And so mainly for that reason, we are total abstainers. And also for that reason, we are already encouraging our children to be total abstainers because it seems that our genetics have made us more vulnerable to alcoholism. In fact, recent studies suggest that there is a 50% chance of, of being predisposed to alcoholism if your family has a history of alcoholism. And we'll get more into that, more into this idea in the, in the weeks to come, but really it comes down to not doing things that would make other people stumble. I like the way the Holman Bible puts Romans 14, 21. It says, it is a noble thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother stumble. Now, there's a lot to that verse that I don't really have time to explain right now, but I will in the weeks to come. But something that this verse says to me is this. It says, Chris, if you drink now in front of Lincoln, Leo, and Noble, 
then Lincoln, Leo, and Noble are much, much more likely to drink when they become adults, and odds are it is going to be a problem for one of them. And so don't even risk it. And again, this is a personal conviction that I don't force on anybody, but I do think it's something for everyone to think about, especially if alcoholism runs in your family. And um, also, I want to say this. If you are currently um, drinking in moderation, I would like for you to take some time to just consider uh, these few questions that I have to make sure that you are not developing a problem currently. The first is this. Do you drink more today than you did a year ago? If your drinking has become noticeably more frequent, then that is a sign that a problem has already developed. The next question is, do you hide the extent of your drinking from people close to you? Secrecy is a sign of addiction. And so if you keep hidden the extent of your drinking, especially from your spouse, that is a sign that a problem has already developed. The third question is, do you get irritated when someone asks, how much, how, how much have you had to drink? You know, this type of defensiveness is a sign that a problem has already developed. And last, can you quit drinking without becoming irritable or depressed? Can you quit drinking? If the answer is no, that is a sign that a problem has already developed. And if you're not sure of the answer, well, I challenge you, give it up. Give up drinking for at least a month or, or two to make sure that you do not have a dependency. If you can't, then a problem has already developed. It was Pastor Bob Russell who said that sin of every kind is insidious. It begins with such a tiny, seemingly harmless thread, but woven around us over the course of time, it becomes a straitjacket that restricts and enslaves because a man is a slave to whatever masters him. Now, thankfully... Jesus is a friend to the addicted because he has the power to liberate. And so real quick, if, if, you, if you know that you have a drug or an alcohol uh, addiction, may I suggest that you take the following four steps. And the first is to admit your problem openly. Tell your spouse, tell your parents, tell your pastor. Admit that you are dealing with an addiction that is out of control. Humbly admitting that you need help is really half the battle. There is power in accountability and in prayer. The Bible says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Second, if you haven't already done so, give your life to Jesus. Recommit your life to Jesus. It's very interesting that most people who successfully overcome a drug or an alcohol addiction credit God as being a key factor. Third, decide that you really want to be free. And I know people who said, oh, I'm chained to this addiction and they act like they want to be free, but they don't really want to be free. You've got to make the decision that you really want to be totally free and not just forgiven. It was C.S. Lewis who said that some people pray, Lord, help me to overcome this sin, but not yet. I'm convinced that God can help the worst addict break even a lifetime of addiction, but they have to desire healing. I love the story of the little boy who was trying to lift a large boulder out of his sandbox. His father watched him from the window as he kind of struggled with this huge rock, and he just could not find the strength to get it over the wall of the sandbox. And finally, the boy sat down in frustration with his hands over his face. The father went out and said, what's wrong, son? Can't you lift that rock over the edge? No, sir, the boy said. And then the father asked, have you used all the strength that's available to you? Yes, sir, the boy said. No, the father said, you haven't. You haven't asked me to help you. And together, they lifted it out. And the point, of course, is that there are some sinful addictions that are too heavy 
for us to lift alone. We need help. We need our Heavenly Father, and we need each other. And so if there is anyone here today, and statistically speaking, there is someone here today who is struggling with an addiction, you are addicted to a substance and you've kept it secret, or you know that you are developing a problem, well, I don't want you to wait. I don't want you to suffer in that situation any longer. Ask for help. That is what your brothers and sisters in Christ are for. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for your wise instruction. And Lord, I ask you to help, um, to help and to heal um, anyone here who is struggling today with an addiction. If, if anyone here is in denial about their addiction, I pray that you would open their eyes. I pray that they would listen to that daughter or son or spouse who is saying, look, you've got a problem. I pray that they would listen. And Lord, I pray as a church family that we would help each other through every struggle, every addiction. Help us to lovingly help people through this old sinful world. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.